Uh, and I know it, it sounds a little bit odd to sort of mix big data and um, and medieval history, but uh, essentially what that means is that I'm combining network analysis, text mining, natural language processing, um, and GIS to understand the boundaries of the medieval history that I study. Um, I'm not looking at the sort of beatific history that's represented in this image of, of Ravenna's Saint Apollinari, uh, whose prayers to the cross I sort of blasphemously replaced with a little network diagram. Um, instead, I'm interested in conflict and fighting. How did medieval people resolve conflict, um, and how did they do so outside the boundaries of formal conflict resolution arenas like sanctioned military action and legal proceedings? Um, I start where any good historian starts, with a close, careful reading of a few sources to sort of figure out what it is that I'm looking at in terms of conflict. Um, but then I extend my work with technology, uh, both in the number of sources and therefore the geographic and temporal scope of my work, but also in terms of the questions that I can ask about conflict resolution. It starts with text mining. So this is the sort of stuff that Google uses when you search for something there. Um, what you see here is sort of a short version of a MySQL database of the history of the Franks by Gregory of Tours. Um, it, was, it was written around 590. Um, and what I've done here is tokenized it, or turned each word into its own entry in a database. Uh, using PHP and MySQL. Um, I've also parsed using Python and a couple of off-the-shelf tools um, so that I can assign root words, that's that root column, and parts of speech. What that lets me do is some of that like fifth grade sentence diagramming that we all hated, so I can figure out how the words in a sentence are related to each other without having to read every single sentence. And then I can use that automated reading process to search for words I know point to conflict, like vengeance. In this case, Divine vengeance. Um, so this is a Catholic king who's punished by divine vengeance for letting his daughter marry a heretic. Uh, and, and vengeance is one of the signals for resolution of conflict. In this case, it's right next to divine, so we know that God is involved. There's another instance, and this is one I found with the text mining process. Here in the life of Romwald, and here in the corner, this is a, uh, a saint's life written in 1040. Um, and in this case, a count chokes to death on a uh, stake from a cow he stole from a farmer because the farmer asked Romuald to pray for divine retribution. So you can see from these two examples how tokenization is really helpful in finding instances of divine conflict that are similar, but not identical. You'll notice the, the case and the endings of the words is a little different, just a little bit off. But it's also an object lesson in how very different conflicts, one about the sort of political and religious implications of intermarriage between two different religious traditions, and one about stealing from farmers, um, can actually use the same kinds of tropes. To manage that, I have a second database that tracks the features of each instance of conflict. So whether it is like this one divinely resolved or uh, negotiated, what kind of conflict it is, is it political or economic, um, who's involved, so that I can manage the 600 or so biographical texts that I'm working with um, and manage all of their contexts easily. But searching for words I know are related to conflict isn't the end goal. Part of the reason that I value technology so much in my work is that it helps me find connections that I wouldn't otherwise have found or even asked about. So to do that, I use those parts of speech tags that you saw on the previous slide and use network analysis to look at the sentence structure and the interrelationship of words so that I can see very quickly words that are related but that I might not have thought of in a traditional synonymic sense. So for instance, in the life of Romuald, you can see that divine uh, vengeance related to words like uh, ludus, game, ardor, passion, or the really interesting one, compost, which often indicates possession or ownership. Um, these are related by way of the verb to resolve, which is a really interesting one. And the piece of this that's oriented toward possession is part of a larger trend that actually changed the historical question I'm asking. Um, my network analysis of the hundred or so sources on which this piece of the process has been done use similar vocabulary to talk about promises, agreements, and signatures, and conflicts, vengeance, and retribution. So what we're seeing is that the creation of a circumstance in which two people agree is talked about in similar terms as the creation of the circumstance in which those two people break that agreement, which is really interesting. That has totally changed how I think about the kinds of phenomena that I'm looking for in my texts. The last part of the project brings all of the conflict discovery into geotemporal context. So this final thing lets me put the linguistic patterns from the text mining into uh, a sort of geotemporal shape that's really valuable for a historian. Um, I can look at how far a source spreads. So in this case, this is the ninth century uh, series of epistle <coughs> biographies written by Agnelis of Ravenna, which is a very large scale compared to that 1040 source that was written about St. Romuald. 
And what I wanted to find out is whether or not the scope and focus of a source affects how divine agency gets used in conflict resolution. This treatment, too, has changed my thinking about divine agency in conflict. I expected sources with a larger scope to depend on divine agency as a way of justifying the outcomes of big events. And what I'm finding instead is that it's the smaller, more localized sources, regardless of whether they're saints' lives or royal biographies, that depend heavily on divine intervention as a way of making those smaller conflicts seem more important. What I want to leave you with is that telescope, microscope image, the idea that as historians and humanities people, we can use big data as a telescope, but we can attach the microscope that is our methodological training and zoom in and out seamlessly so that we can think about the kinds of tools we use as an extension of our historical methodology as opposed to a replacement for it. And that's true in the classroom as well. And that is my five minutes.